Hello and welcome to the brand management keynote at ApacheCon Asia 2022. My name is Mark Thomas and I've been involved at the Apache Software Foundation for about 20 years now. I spend the majority of my time working on Apache Tomcat, but I also spend a little bit of time at the Eclipse Foundation where I contribute to the Jakarta EE specifications that Tomcat implements. My day job is at VMware, where I have a very simple job description. Go and do whatever you think is best for Apache Tomcat. One of the things I've been involved in in doing that is managing Tomcat's brand, so addressing potential infringements and uh, progressing a number of trademark registrations. As part of that, I got involved in the brand management committee and I've been VP brand management since 2018. So why does the ASF care about brands, brand management, and trademarks? Well, the answer is really very simple. It all comes down to community. If you're involved at the ASF for any length of time, you'll come across the phrase community over code. And what that simple phrase is trying to get across is the importance of a strong community to the long-term health of a project. What we've seen time and time again is that if a community has an issue with the code, whether it be it's buggy, um, it's hard to maintain, it needs re-architecting for some reason, whatever the problem is, if the project has a strong community, they can address those problems and they can produce some great code. The converse is not true. If the community is struggling, if they can't attract new people to replace other people as they move on, uh, if they don't work well together, they're not working collaboratively, it doesn't matter how good the code is, the community will be broken and the long-term health of the project will be at risk. And where brand comes into this is that brand is the identity of the community. It, what's what steers people towards the ASF and what I like to call the contribution funnel. So when somebody first starts using an Apache project, the brand directs them to the ASF and they'll start researching the project, finding more about it and they're a user. After a little while, they might start contributing. They might submit a bug report, they might ask a question on a mailing list, they might answer a question on Stack Overflow, but whatever it is, they start contributing. After they've been contributing for a while, they might become a committer, and then committers will hope to become PMC members. So by initially directing people to the ASF, we bring people into that contribution funnel, which provides ultimately PMC members, which helps maintain the long-term health of the project. When I look at how ASF products are used, they're used in all sorts of different ways. I've taught Tomcat training courses, both commercially and on a community basis. And there's a huge amount of academic research about Apache projects. That's primarily because all of our development is done in the open. So all of the mailing lists, all of the issue trackers, all of the software, all of the discussions, everything's there in the open. So for academics looking into the researching the process of software development, that's a fantastic resource where they can see how things have evolved over time. Similarly, it's useful for people looking at doing some research around um, software security. So we see a lot of academic research around Apache projects for those reasons. Uh, you get companies like Microsoft and Amazon taking Apache projects, packaging them as services and then selling those services. You'll see conferences based around either individual Apache projects or groups of related Apache projects. Um, and of course, you get Apache projects that are used as the commercial basis for, sorry, as a basis for a number of commercial products. So lots of different ways that Apache products are used. And from an ASF perspective, we welcome them all. Now, our license requires some of those uses to be acknowledged. So if you build a product based on Apache software, then you have to acknowledge that use. But it's great to see the use of Apache products acknowledged whenever that happens. And to help people do that properly, so to steer people towards that contribution funnel, we have a number of policies that are essentially about how to use our marks. The first one is a general one. So that provides general advice that if you want to refer to an Apache product, this is how you do it. And we then have a couple of more specific policies, and those are generally for the areas 
where things are a little bit more complicated, where we might have had a few issues in the past and we want to provide a little bit more clarity. So for product names, and more on that in a second, domain names, events, and merchandise and swag, we have dedicated policies. And all of those policies are available for people to read on our website in the resources section. A general theme across all of those policies is we want to keep them as relaxed as we can with a very minimal approvals process. A lot of the approvals process is on the basis of you actually don't need explicit approval. If you want to do it, but if you want to do this and you do it like that, that's fine. You don't need to ask us, carry on. If you do need to ask approval, then it's normally as simple as sending an email to the relevant mailing list. We will always be vendor neutral in those approvals, so we won't show favoritism. If we let one person or organization do something, then if other people make us the same request, then we'll say yes, yes to them as well. We don't enter into exclusive relationships. It's always a level playing field. What we're looking to do, and it all comes back to that contribution funnel, is maintain the center of gravity of the project at the SF. So if people want to find out more, get more involved, it steers them towards the SF, not anywhere else, because that's how we maintain the long-term health of the projects. I said I'd talk a little bit more about naming, and this is one that we do see um, quite a few issues with. Now, I must stress the vast majority of these are entirely accidental. And, and when we point out the problem, people are always very willing to change it. And they, they understand our concerns and it's not an issue. And we don't mind, you know, mistakes made accidentally or mistakes made in good faith. Um, you know, we accept that that happens. And as long as they're put right when we point them out, that's fine. So let's imagine that you're a company called Smallco and you've produced a software product called Widget. If you want to call it Smallco Widget, good name, can't argue with that. And the ASF isn't going to have any objection at all. Now, if Widget happens to be, say, built on top of Apache Tomcat and you want to reference that in the name, then there is only one form of words that we will allow, and that is small co widget powered by Apache Tomcat. And the reason that we're explicit about that is that we need to be very clear which company is responsible for which bit. So that form of name is very clear that widget is, belongs to small co and it's built on top of Tomcat that's provided by Apache. Now, if widget is more a plugin or an add-in for Tomcat, then you can use the small co widget for Apache Tomcat naming convention, but those are really the only two conventions we allow if you want to use our marks in your product name. What we often see are the problematic forms, so that would be small co Tomcat or Tomcat widget or something like that. Now, the issue with small co Tomcat is that that makes Tomcat look like a small co project. So when people want to know more about it, they go to small co, that directs them away from the ASF, away from our contribution funnel. And ultimately that creates a risk to the long-term health of the project. That's why we don't like that name. And the Tomcat widget, that's actually got a slightly different problem. There, it looks like widget is actually an Apache product, um, part, you know, part of the Tomcat project. So there, the problem that that creates is when there are issues with widget, um, then people come to the ASF to get those problems solved. Or if they're not solved, it creates reputational damage because they think the ASF is at fault. So small code Tomcat, Tomcat widget, definitely problematic. When we do see those, then we ask people to change them. And as I say, they, 99 times out of 100, they do, and there, there's no problem. So those are the policies uh, that the ASF have. We also offer a number of services. Now, the vast majority of these services are directed towards Apache products and projects, but we do, um, in terms of advice, offer a little bit of advice to external entities. But that advice is generally limited to, I want to do this, um, and the, this usually involves an Apache brand or mark in some way, and would the ASF object? And the answer is either, a, no, that's absolutely fine, or yes, we would object, because of this but if you do it like that that would be okay but the advice we provide externally is kind of limited to those, those scenarios and we're, yeah we're happy to answer those questions if you want to use our marks and you're not sure whether we'll object you know, feel free to ask us and we'll, and we'll let you know and for advice projects and external people can email trademarks at apache.org and for a project it can be absolutely any question related to project brand 
And it's often about, um, is this infringing? We've, we found this, is this a problem? Or uh, my employer wants to do this, is that okay? How do we get the brand registered? Um, should we use TM or should we use R? Those, sort, those sorts of questions. And those are answered on a, um, by the volunteers on the mailing list. And if you want to get involved in brand management at the ASF, then joining the trademarks list and contributing to that volunteer effort is a good place to start. Because it's all done on a volunteer basis, then there's no monetary cost to the ASF, unless the, the issue is a little bit more complicated and we need to ask council. Now, I said it could be absolutely any question at all related to project brand. And um, one we had, I think it was a couple of years ago, a project wanted to um, use a pride version of their logo for pride month. Was that okay? Absolutely. Um, project's in complete control of its logos. If project wants to do that, that's fine. Um, no objections at all. Yeah, crack on it and good luck. So any questions at all around that a project has around the brand, you know, please email trademarks at apache.org and we'll do our best to answer them. We also provide registration services to projects. And the purpose of doing this is essentially to make the life of the project easier to enable them to, to manage their brand more efficiently. And we, this happens in two ways. First of all, it makes protecting our marks easier. If we have an issue with the way one of our marks is being used on a site like Amazon, GitHub, um, any, of, any, any site hosted by any of the big ISPs, Facebook, Twitter, anything like that, all of those companies will have a standard process for reporting a trademark issue. And it will usually start with, please identify a country that your trademark is registered in and its registration number. So if you don't have a registered mark, you can't use that process, which makes protecting your marks on those sites a whole lot harder. And to give an example, last year, there was an issue with a marketplace seller on Amazon who was selling books at quite a steep price, about $80, $90 a time. And the books were claiming to be you know, the definitive guide to Apache this, Apache that, Apache the other. And some of our users were buying these books. When they bought them, they found that they're actually nothing to do with the Apache product at all. It was effectively a, a bait and switch. So because we had um, our marks were registered, we were able to use Amazon's standard process to get those books taken off sale. And we were able to do that pretty quickly. It would have been a whole lot harder had we not had the registered marks. Another area where a registration helps is that of potential conflicts. And you don't actually see the benefit here because of what, because of having the registration prevents things happening in the first place. But what will happen in the naming of a product is that when a company has got this new product and they've got their short list of names, one of the things they'll do is a trademark search on each of those potential names. And if they find that one of those potential names conflicts with an existing trademark, they're much less likely to choose that name for their own product. And because it's less likely to be used, they're then less likely of the conflict happening further down the line. So we don't necessarily know about all of the potential conflicts that saved us, but it does save us dealing with those conflicts at a later date. Whether or not to register one of a project's trademark is entirely down to the PMC. Um, personally, I would recommend that projects do, but it is a project decision whether or not to do so. At the foundation level, we have registered Apache. And we've done that because it provides a degree of protection to all of our product projects, because our project's full names are Apache Ivy, Apache Ant, Apache Maven, Apache Hadoop. So by protecting Apache, we do have a degree of protection for the project. But as I say, I would recommend that the projects have a registration as well. And when we do that, most of the time we'll register the bare name. So Tomcat, Hadoop, Kafka, and so on. Sometimes if we hit a difficulty in registering the name because there's some sort of conflict or, or other issue, one of the options we've got to address that is say, actually, no, we'll just register the full name instead. So I think we did this with Flink in China. We registered Apache Flink because there was some issue with registering Flink. I can't actually remember what it was offhand. Um, now it's not necessarily the case that there's a conflict, but there's some sort of difficulty. And we then we have to look at, well, how much will it cost us to overcome that difficulty that way? 
oh, it'll cost us that much, but for a lot less, we can just register the full name or let's go that route instead. In terms of registrations, let's say US registrations, they're available to all projects on request, and it costs us about $1,500, assuming that everything goes smoothly. Uh, the process there is very simple. The project just re requests it. Um, the project then has to gather some basic information, which we package up and pass on to the legal team. The legal team then take that and actually complete all the registration application paperwork, submit it, and then see that through to completion, which happens about six months or so later, hopefully. And then once we've received that registration, then the project needs to make a few updates to their website. And all of that costs about, say, $1,500. In terms of registration in other jurisdictions, we are happy to consider that um, and we'll look at it on a case by case basis. So typically what we see are requests for registrations in China and the EU. But what we look at is, is there a concentration of that project community in that area? Is there going to be benefits to having protection in that area? And we'll look at how much is it gonna cost and the potential risks and make a decision based on that basis. And normally we say yes, because you know, the requests that projects make are reasonable, but we do look at each one. Cost for that can vary considerably. It starts at about $6,000, sorry, $600, but can go up to several thousand. And it depends, to be honest, it varies a lot by jurisdiction. So that's one of the factors we look at. What are the costs of registering in that particular jurisdiction? When we do register, um, we register in Nice class nine. There are actually 45 different classes you can register a trademark in. And we use class nine, which is the one where the software registrations are. We do have a few other registrations um, in other classes for services and for um, training, I believe. But the vast majority of our registrations are in class nine. Now, the prices I mentioned before were the sort of happy path costs. Registration costs can be rather more than that. And to give a couple of examples using our Apache registration. So in the US, there's a fairly small difficulty. The, there was an existing registration for Apache. Uh, the company that owned it no longer existed. All we had to do was get that registration cancelled. But just doing that ended up quadrupling the cost to about $6,000. In China, our registration for Apache is still in progress. And to date, we spent about $40,000 and it's going to be a little bit more because we haven't quite finished the registration process yet. Um, and there, there's no significant difficulty. It's just a number of relatively small things that are taking a while to work through. And just because of the number of things and the time the lawyers have had to spend dealing with them, that's what's pushed the costs up. I'm from memory, there was a handful of registrations that were viewed as potentially conflicting, which we could address by just adjusting our description of goods. And there was one mark that we needed to get cancelled and a couple of other things as well, I think. So altogether, it's taken a bit of time and that time and that particular that lawyer time has cost us money, but hopefully we should see that complete um, later this year. Another service we provide to projects is that of assignment. So when a project is donated to the foundation, one of the conditions of that donation is if the project graduates into a top level project, then any marks associated with that project need to be donated to the ASF as part of the graduation process. Now, commercial companies tend to take a very different view to how many registrations and which jurisdictions than the ASF, and they generally uh, register a lot more than the ASF does. So donated products normally come with a handful of registrations and they're often in classes other than class nine as well. So what we usually do with those is once we've received them, the class nine ones are maintained, we'll keep them going. Um, but the ones in other classes, we typically allow to lapse once they're due for renewal. Now, again, all of that is done on a case by case basis. A couple of times we've looked at the renewal costs of a class nine registration and in the jurisdiction concerned, the costs were particularly high. The product didn't have much of a community in that area. The benefits of the registration didn't really justify the cost. So those class nine registrations we allowed to lapse. 
Equally, there are class 42 registrations around services where we thought, actually, that registration is really useful to the project. We're going to maintain that registration. And we're going to renew it. So I say each one we look at at a case by case basis. And what we're trying to do is do what's best for the project, bearing in mind that we are a charity and we need to use our money wisely. One thing that's worth mentioning at this point is that assignment is nearly always a bespoke process. And because it's a bespoke process, that takes lawyers time and that ends up costing us money. And it's nearly always more expensive than a new registration. What's happened a couple of times, and I understand completely where people are coming from when they do this, they think, ah, oh, I'll save the ASF some money. I'll register my project marks and then donate them to the ASF to save the ASF the cost of the registration. And say, so I completely understand where you're coming from. I very much appreciate the gesture, but actually the assignment process ends up costing us more money than the, the registrations would have done if we'd done them ourselves in the first place. So if you're thinking along those lines, thank you very much, but please just ask us to do the registration. It'll end up costing us less money in the long term. Finally, the area where we provide services to projects is infringement. And the key piece of advice here is before you do anything about a potential infringement for one of your projects marks, please come and ask trademarks at apache.org for advice first. We've had a couple of instances where people have sent off emails about a potential infringement and have come very close to causing us all sorts of problems. I mean, first of all, there's the PR issue. Um, if we accuse somebody of trademark infringement, we do it publicly and we're wrong. That's not going to look good. But there's also legal risks. Depending on exactly what you say and the jurisdiction you say it in, you can open yourself up to legal risk if you accuse somebody incorrectly of infringing a trademark. So always, always, always ask for advice first. And when you get that advice, keep it private. Trademarks at Apache.org is privately archived. It's not available outside to people outside of the ASF. And in terms of project communication, keep that on your private lists as well. What we do find is when there is a problem, by far the most effective way of dealing with it is a polite request in private. And in the vast majority of cases, the issue is resolved quite quickly and easily that way. And very simple. So the vast majority of what the brand management committee does, you won't actually see evidence of on our public mailing lists. If something's a little bit tricky, then we can always ask council for advice. And um, that's usually of the form, hey, we've, we've discovered this use, we really don't like it because of this. Um, what we'd like to happen is this, by the way, here's this additional background information. Um, and here's the email that we've drafted. What did you think? And council either come back and say, yes, that's absolutely fine. Or they'll make recommendations of a different way of doing things. Sometimes we'll actually get council to make the approach instead, um, depending on the circumstances. Finally, um, the other thing we need to do on the infringement side is actually respond to incoming infringement complaints. The majority of these are actually misdirected um, DMCA takedown notices. What happens is uh, people host material that's viewed as infringing. They host it on Apache web server. The companies do, sort of addressing those issues see the Apache web server and assume that we control it. Um, obviously, we don't. So um, those notices are reasonably politely declined with a suggestion that uh, they look up who is and how to use it. Occasionally, we get genuine complaints. And in those cases, we'll look at what's going on. And what we're going to try and do is understand what happened and how we got there and do the right thing. If a, if a mistake has been made or something's happened in good faith, then we'll, we'll do our best to correct that, even if legally we don't have to. The key thing for us is not to do what's legally right. It's to go beyond that and, and basically do the right thing. So we'll always try and, and do that. And occasionally... That might mean changing a logo or, or changing a project name. So with that, that brings me to the end of this session. So I'd like to summarize things by just reminding everyone that the whole purpose of the brand management at the ASF is to ultimately support the long-term health of our project communities. Everything we do is done with that in mind. I hope you found this session useful. Uh, the contact details on this final slide, as well as the website where you can find out more information. Thank you very much.